You know, we we submitted that legislation within days after you sending update. We still haven't gotten a bill out of the lawyer's office. I mean, it's tough because no one wants to really. I'll catch up with you after. Thank you for coming. Anybody from, actually anywhere from the state of Rhode Island, it's always good. This is the second one I've been to. They're uh, pretty informative. And what I can recommend from my other one is don't be ashamed to ask any questions. Every question that you need to ask, you need to ask now, and they'll try and answer them as the best they can. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, yes. Uh, so, uh, just a couple of housekeeping issues before we get started. If there is an event where we have to exit the facility quickly, we've got the exits on both sides, and then uh, one's in the back. And this is also a smoke-free uh, location, so no smoking inside. And if you do have coffee, they did ask that you put the lid on the on the coffee. Uh, there is coffee in the back for those that would like some. Good morning. I'm uh, Secretary of State Greg Amore. Uh, to my right is Kathy Consencia. She is the Elections Director for the State uh, Department, uh, and to my left is Rob Rock, and he is the Deputy Secretary of State who oversees elections. Uh, these two folks are elections experts. Uh, I'm slowly but surely uh, becoming an election expert, uh, but these folks have worked in elections for years and years, decades, actually, um, and are considered to be uh, experts in their field. Rob is considered to be a national uh, elections expert. Um, so uh, we, we try to, we try to use our expertise um, and we try to make sure that uh, any question you ask, 
ask is answered. Uh, I do want to acknowledge Councilman Anderson, who I just met. Uh, he is here as well. Um, and we have had a very good turnout across the state thus far. Uh, there are, there's at least one more of these planned um, in, at a future date that will be advertised, and that will be at the Board of Elections. Um, and it will include the vendor uh, for our machines, ESNS. Um, and that will be open uh, to discuss what the machines do, um, how the process uh, for mail ballots in particular work at the Board of Elections, but any questions that you might have at the Board of Elections. And that will happen obviously before uh, voting begins uh, for the, the general election in November. Um, so so I'll, I'll start like this because I think it's important. When I ran for this office, I, I, I did so um, uh, talking about uh, the idea that we have to speak to one another uh, civilly. And I have, uh, I have tried to do that uh, throughout my political career. I spent 10 years in the House. I spent uh, 30 years as a history teacher in East Providence. And I just think you know, Americans uh, need to treat each other uh, as fellow Americans and with respect. And I I'm, I'm not happy when I hear uh, someone be dismissive of questions about uh, election integrity. You know, if you have a question about election integrity, that's a legitimate question. And, and we should treat every one of those questions as such. Now, you're not, you're not going to like everything you hear today, uh, but some of that is based on what the law is. Uh, some of that is based on legislation that is existing. And what we're going to try to focus on today is the process under the current law uh, and how that process works. And we'll answer every question uh, you have uh, until you have no more. I do want to start by talking about what we've done to shore up the process uh, since I took office last uh, January, so it's a little over a year from now. And, and some folks are here today who have been at other forums. I apologize that you're going to hear this uh, for the second or third time. Uh, the first thing we did when we got into office was we addressed an issue uh, with the express voting machine uh, and the testing of the express voting machine. The express voting machine is mandated by federal law and it serves uh, the disabled community. Um, and uh, you, you probably remember this. Uh, in the primary, uh, what year was, was that, 22? Uh, in the primary, um, the wrong name appeared on the screen of the express voting machine. Uh, and, and I believe it was Mayor Lewis's name was on the, on the screen and he was, he was turned out. Uh, and a few people had voted, I think five people had voted or, or somewhere around there, uh, and it was uh, brought to the attention. And, and you probably remember there was a back and forth between the Board of Elections and the former Secretary of State about whose responsibility it was to test that machine, whose responsibility it was to get those ballots right. Uh, and that was a, it was a terrible mistake. It was a terrible mistake. Um, so the first thing we did when we came into office was we, we promoted legislation that would clearly delineate the role of the Board of Election and the Secretary of State. And, and I think our system is a good system where we separate the political me uh, from the process, the Board of Elections. The Board of Elections deals with the vote itself. They deal with who qualifies for the ballot. They deal with challenges around elections. That should not be someone like me whose name appears on a ballot. Uh, and I, so I think our system is set up the right way. But in this case, there was a dispute as to whose responsibility it was to test those machines, how those machines should be tested. And so we asked the General Assembly uh, to vote on legislation that would clarify that, make sure that we knew who the testing, who was responsible for testing, who was responsible for the, the paper ballot and submitting the ballot to the vendor. And the General Assembly overwhelmingly passed this legislation to clarify that. And so far, so good, we have not had an issue since. Uh, this year, we are trying to address an issue that you're all familiar with as well, and that's the issue with the forgeries on nomination papers. And that first surfaced uh, in the Congressional District 1 race, where Sabina Matos's campaign had a number of signatures on the nomination forms that were forged. They, they were, a crime was committed. Um, and what happened during that process is there was not great communication between the Board of Elections and the cities and towns. Uh, and the media was reporting before we were getting official word on what was happening in regard to that situation. And so our legislation that is before the General Assembly now uh, would, would clean that up. In fact, we went before the Board uh, of Elections uh, prior to uh, the nomination period for the presidential preference primary, and we talked to them about shoring up that process. And so what's that look like? 
Uh, if there's an issue, a city or town uh, official uh, can uh, contact, should, must contact the Board of Elections and say, look, we see a pattern of uh, fraud, a pattern of forgery, and you should be aware of this. It's on this campaign sheet. This is the name of the collector. The Board of Elections then uh, reaches out to all cities and towns, makes those cities and towns aware of the problem. And that happened with the Ramaswamy campaign. Uh, and within a 24-hour period, every single canvassing authority knew of the issue. Uh, the Board of Elections knew of the issue, uh, and I, I believe it was handled properly, and that's without the law. But we want to make sure when the Board of Elections changes uh, that, that, that the law doesn't change. And so we're, we're doing that. And, and uh, the No Labels Party has an issue with that right now, uh, where, there, where there's a pattern of fraud, fraud on some of those nomination signatures. So we're trying to shore that process up. This also gives me a good opportunity to talk about the, the names of the people that were on the, that, those lists that were deceased. And, and I think what happened during that process is people started to conflate the fact that a deceased person was forged, a deceased person's name was forged, so that meant that they were on the voter list, the, the, the voter, voter rolls. In every one of those cases, the, the deceased person's name was not on our voter list. So they would have been crossed off regardless. So let's say there was an attempt to, uh, to ask for a mail ballot uh, from a deceased voter. In those cases, in every one of those cases, the person was never a registered voter or they were on the list but as deceased. And, and, and no one really reported that, but, but it showed that our voter list was accurate because those folks would have been crossed off as, as not being legitimate registered voters for the process. So we're trying to clean that up uh, as well. Um, and then the other question that gets asked at these forums quite a bit is in regard to the driver privilege cards. Uh, and the driver privilege, privilege cards, as you know, uh, look identical uh, to the uh, Rhode Island licenses and the Rhode Island IDs. Um, so, so the question is, can someone take that license and go into a uh, polling location and use it as ID uh, for a vote? Uh, so so the, the answer is twofold. One, uh, they can only get that license at the DMV uh, in a process that requires them to put forward documents that does not allow them to register at, at the DMV as a citizen would be able to. So, so none of those folks are registering at the DMV uh, to be voters. And so if they went to a polling location uh, and tried to use that ID, uh, the, the, the machine, right, the, the, uh, the poll book, would pop up a message that said voter not found because that voter is not registered. All right, so the DMV also keeps data on the non-citizens that have driver's licenses. And that data is shared with the Department of State and cross-checked based on uh, who, who is trying to register or who, if, if it gets through the system, we talked about this last time, who voted. Uh, and then we have the responsibility to turn that information over to the authorities. Uh, and, I, and it's usually at this point where I talk about uh, the 2020 situation where there were three double voters in Rhode Island. Uh, there were three folks who voted in both Florida and Rhode Island. Uh, all three of those folks were uh, identified in a post-election audit, and two of those, uh, two, of, two of the three of those people were prosecuted for double voting. It is not a crime in the United States to be registered in two places. It's a crime to vote in two places. Uh, and those two people were prosecuted. The third gentleman, after an investigation, was found to have uh, been suffering from uh, dementia or Alzheimer's, uh, and that person was not prosecuted. Uh, so, so that gives you kind of a broad look at uh, at the issues that we're dealing with, and in the last case, the driver privilege card, a question that has been uh, brought up at every one of these forums, and I'm sure uh, Senator Rogers and Senator Vila Cruz get that question all the time as well, and so I thought I'd start by addressing that. Um, you know, we're, we're open to ideas uh, to make the system better uh, under existing law. Okay, so, so the legislators here are responsible for putting forward that law and having discussions around that and, and, and pushing for any changes they think uh, would be smart. But we're always looking to improve, right? I, I was out front on that Sabina Matos thing. Uh, I came out in the early days and said the Board of Elections needs to review every single one of these signatures. Uh, and people said to me, well, there's a challenge process. The way I read the law was that they had the ability to check in real time, and I, and I came out and said that immediately. 
Uh, now, we're forcing them to do that in the proposed legislation, uh, even though I think they have that, uh, that right now under current law. And so I am not adverse to hearing uh, about an issue and trying to address that issue. Uh, I, I think it's incredibly important that Americans have confidence uh, in their election system. Uh, but I also think it's incredibly important that when there is misinformation, when someone is making a claim that a dead person voted, uh, that we push back on that with the data that we have. Uh, and, and, and that's what we've done. And if, and I say this all the time, uh, wherever I go, if there's a problem, I think it's important that our department comes out and says it right away and says, yes, there's a problem. Yes, this is the issue. Yes, this is how we're addressing it. Uh, and I, and, I, and I, I will have you hold me to that, and every Rhode Islander hold, hold me to that, that there will be nothing kept from the voters of Rhode Island in regard to systems, in regard to process. Uh, and if we find a flaw, a hole, a problem, then we will do the best we can to address it, as we have done in the two situations that I outlined. So I'll, I'll leave it at that, and then I'm going to turn it over to Rob. I don't know if you have any opening remarks. Uh, no, I, I think, well, just before we open it up to questions, I know one of the other questions we've been getting a lot of is voter list maintenance, uh, and, and we're happy to, to talk about any questions that you have on, on voter list maintenance. Just quickly, we work with a number of agencies, both in the state and outside the state, to make sure that our voter lists are as accurate as possible. We have a, an electronic connection with our Department of Health here in Rhode Island, and every week we get a list of voters who have passed away. We forward that information down to the cities and towns who will process the records accordingly. We also have a connection with our Department of Corrections, so we get two lists from them every month. We get a list of people who have been incarcerated in a correctional facility upon a felony conviction in which those voters are taken off the list. And then we get a list of voters who have been released from a correctional facility after being found guilty of a felony, and their name is re-put onto the list based on a, a constitutional amendment that passed in, in 2006. We also get uh, information every 60 days from the National Social Security Death Master File. So this tells us everybody in the country who passed away somewhere in another state but is registered in Rhode Island. Someone may go live with a loved one in Florida or in Massachusetts, and if they pass away there but they're registered here, we get that information uh, as well. So we're constantly doing voter list uh, maintenance, and, and really it's the cities and towns that are doing uh, voter list maintenance. Really the cities and towns are the ones that add and delete voters, cancel voters, and keep the list as accurate as possible from information that our office provides. So there is constant uh, voter list maintenance that goes on in all 39 cities and towns to make sure that our voter lists are uh, as accurate as possible. Can we use the United States Postal Service change of address uh, data as well to take care of that? But I would say that you know our citizens have to do that as well. Uh, and if you may have a relative that has moved. Uh, you may have a, a, a friend that has moved. Uh, and you know, most people are not thinking about changing their voter information when they move. They're thinking about other things. But you could remind them. I reminded my daughter when she moved to Washington, D.C., she has to take care of that. You know, that's on her. That's her responsibility as an American citizen to change that, that data uh, in our system and then, you know, uh, register to vote where she is in Washington, D.C. Uh, and that's on us. And, and the same is true if you are getting election mail. And I talk about election mail uh, because it's a way that we can determine if someone is not at the address that we have them listed at. So, uh, for example, in the 2020 election, uh, uh, mail ballot applications were sent out to every registered Rhode Island voter during the pandemic. You know, that was a, a blessing in disguise because so many of those came back undeliverable that those folks who, whose names were on the undeliverables were put on the inactive voter list. And then two federal elections after that, which is now, uh, in my first uh, year in office, we removed 62,000 uh, people from the voter rolls based on that election's mail. That's not the only election's mail that we do. When someone registers, they get a letter. And if, and if that letter is returned to us, then clearly that's not a good address. And then, and then we, we're gonna do the same thing. Anytime we send out elections mail, and we're committed as an administration to do a periodical broad elections mail for this purpose. I'll hand it over to Kathy if she wants to uh, start with uh, some opening remarks as well. I just want to um, add to Rob's um, statements on, on voter list maintenance. Um, the cities and towns also receive data from their own vital statistics on uh, persons that are deceased so that they're able to remove them from the from their voter list. Um, so we don't actually delete anyone from the voter list, but they're canceled. They remain on the voter list, but they're canceled. So you can't do any other activity to that voter record other than uh, just they'll just remain on the list, but you'll see when that person is canceled. 
And this whole thing is better than it was four years ago, and much better than it was eight years ago, and much better than it was three years ago. Um, clearly, these are the most scrutinized elections in American history. Um, and, and that's good. That's a good thing, right? They should be scrutinized. I think you're gonna, you're gonna see a, a, a book come out from a well-known Rhode Islander, Ken Block, who writes about uh, his investigation into um, voter fraud. Uh, and the more light that is shined on all of this, the better we are, are as a country, uh, the better off we are as a state. So, you know, scrutiny is good. Forums are good, questions are good, um, and, I, and I think we have a couple of people here who know that if you ask the Department of State to provide you information, uh, we will do that. And we will do that uh, with, with anything we are able to provide under the law. We'll get that to you, we'll talk to you about it, uh, and we'll provide any information that, that you request from us. So I guess we'll open it up to questions uh, at this point. <clears throat> First of all, I, my name is Pat Ford, I live in Cumberland. Um, I do some local uh, journalism. I want to first attest to uh, the flexibility and the responsiveness of the Secretary of State's office here in Rhode Island, particularly under this administration. I'm the former chair of the Libertarian Party in the state. We've had a number of run-ins over the years with, with petitioning and everything. The, the transparency and the responsiveness from your office, is, frankly, is phenomenal. And I can tell people stories about it afterwards. There's something about calling me back on Thanksgiving Day. I'll, uh, <laughs> I'll warn everybody. But <clears throat> what's interesting about this recent series of elections is folks have, it's come to light how tortured the petitioning is to get on the ballot. And a lot of that has to do with the fact that in past years, Republicans and Democrats have had an endorsed party candidate. They've got a state party list that they can then follow. And it's an easier process because it's, it's well-defined names and addresses. You can reach out to people. This time around, though, with regard to uh, the... Uh, special congressional election in particular, there was no endorsed party candidate. And uh, as a result, all the candidates, the 10 or 12 of them, had to engage in the kind of techniques that grassroots independent political parties had, which is go out on your own, stand outside of market baskets, knock on doors, have parties, do whatever you have to do to get a significant number of signatures. Now my question about is the process after that. Uh, the Board of Elections goes through an exhaustive effort to verify the legitimacy of signatures. And very often, there is as much as a 20 or 30% rejection rate based on addresses, uh, you know, deceased, I, all sorts of reasons. Well, people's signatures have changed radically. In the, in the recent past, it was complicated by a very short appeal process uh, where you would go to the, and the Libertarian Party went at three separate hearings to get our candidate on the gubernatorial election, a guy named Elijah Gizarelli, over a process of about six weeks. My understanding now is that your legislation addresses significantly and gives independent, particularly independent candidates who may be running for the very first time and not really acutely aware of the ins and outs of petitioning uh, additional time. So I was wondering if you could explain that sure. so that people understand the pitfalls and the traps and maybe what you're doing to address that. So I, I talked about one part of that legislation, which was the uh, nominations uh, process. Um, so basically right now, there's about a 10-day window to collect signatures. That's, that's it. Uh, our legislation, which would move the primary, uh, would also move the entire calendar. So we move the primary to the first um, um, Tuesday in September. Uh, no, excuse me, the first Tuesday, the last Tuesday in August from what is usually the first Tuesday in September. But then we would back everything else up. So candidates would file in May. Uh, they would have uh, 21 days, is it 21 days in legislation, to collect signatures. And then to your point, uh, the Board of Elections would have a full week to address any issues. Right now, in some cases, they have a few days, uh, and that is it. So this, this proposed legislation would take pressure off candidates uh, because it extends the period of time to collect signatures. It would take pressure off the local uh, canvassing uh, authority because it would uh, put, put, put them focused on those signatures without a, a pressing deadline. And it would give the Board of Elections legitimately uh, a full week to address any issues and challenges uh, that there may be. So this is part of a broader uh, change in the elections calendar that we put forward to the General Assembly. To some extent, we, we did this last year. It wasn't as broad as this. This year is a much more comprehensive piece of legislation. Uh, but that takes some pressure off the system. Uh, in its entirety. And, and then for us, and what I'm very concerned about, is under the, current, um, under the current calendar, if we have a disputed election, if there is a recount, if there is litigation, 
we will push up against the, the MOVE Act, which requires us to get our overseas ballots out 45 days prior to election day. And, and the last thing we want to do is disenfranchise our military folks. Uh, the last thing we want to do is make sure that someone who is serving on an aircraft carrier is, is, not, is not allowed to vote because we can't get the ballot out to them. Um, and, and that will happen. If we have a disputed election under the current calendar, we're going to be in violation of the MOVE Act, we're going to get sued by the Department of Justice, and more importantly, we're going to disenfranchise somebody who's serving their country. And, and that's unacceptable to us, and that's why from the minute I got in office, I pushed on this calendar to give us more time just in case there is a disputed election. I just want to stress, if, and just if people are considering running for office, reach out to their office because they're an incredible font of knowledge and practical experience through some of the pitfalls you can run into. Uh, it's it's a complicated process because of all these laws, but there are resources, and I, you know it's it, it's impressive what the effort these folks bring to bear. So qualification on the signatures is a big deal when it comes down to the candidacy. However, the qualifications when it comes down to mail ballots being submitted and those signatures being validated, that seems to be problematic. And there's a time deadline that we're up against, right? So there's definitely a time deadline. And the separation, the point of no return, is the separation of the mail ballot from those certs. So how is that addressed? How many signatures are on record? How many are being compared? What's the qualification standards that are being used? How does that work? So you want to talk about the truck? Yeah, so are, are you talking about for candidates or for ma mail ballots? No, mail ballots. Okay, so mail ballot certifications, because the, the prior prior time you said that the signatures that are coming in on the poll pads are not of concern, but the mail ballot signatures are of great concern. So clearly you have to have multiple signatures that you can pair against. Right. People aren't going to be able to have the same signatures. And if you're having problems with validating signatures for candidates because of the time delays involved, what does that say about the timing necessary when you get a mail ballot in at the last second? Yep. So the, and it may be questionable. Yep, so I'm going to go through the entire mail ballot process as it relates to signatures. Okay. So if someone, if someone wants to apply for a mail ballot and they use a paper form, they fill out the form, they sign the form, and they send it to their city and town hall, the Board of Canvassers. The Board of Canvassers will uh, look at that paper and match it up against the information that's in the voter registration system to ensure that the person is eligible to vote and eligible to receive a mail ballot. And one of those requirements is to match the signature that's on the application to the signature that is in the voter registration file for the voter. Now, a voter may have, myself, uh, myself for an example, I think I've got eight signatures in my voter record uh, in the voter registration system. It's when I registered to vote, it's when I moved twice, it's when I applied for a mail ballot. Every time I've signed an elections document, my signature is captured by the voter registration system. So if I were to vote by mail, my board of canvassers takes my application, they match the signature on my application to the signature in the system. If that signature matches and all of the other information matches, then that individual will be sent a mail ballot. Okay, so our office will send the mail ballot out usually somewhere between 28 and 30 days before an election. The voter receives it, they vote their ballot, they put it inside what we call the mail ballot certificate envelope, and that envelope needs to be signed by the voter. So the voter signs the envelope and sends it back to the Board of Elections. When the Board of Elections receives it, they take the envelope and they have groups of people that will be sitting at monitors that will display the signatures for those individuals on a screen. And teams of election officials will make sure that the signature on that envelope matches the signatures for that voter in the voter registration system. They're using the same voter registration system that the cities and towns use to validate the signature in the first place. So, and, and the Board of Elections can start certifying mail ballots 20 days before an election. So when we send out the ballots to somebody, they'll receive it on, let's say, the 26th day before the election. Some people want to be uh, diligent, and they fill out their ballot, and they send it back right away. As soon as the Board of Elections receives it, they can process it, they can certify it. And by the way, that mail ballot certification process is open to the public. So anybody in this room or anybody in the state can go to the Board of Elections, and you can watch them match the signatures on these envelopes the signatures that are in the voter registration file. The Board of Elections has to post notice of when these meetings take place. So they post it on our website, uh, they post it legally, they've got to provide at least 48 hours notice 
for, uh, for these certification meetings to take place so anybody can, can watch it. Now, Chris, to your point, voters have until 8 p.m. on election day to return their mail ballot. So they can drop it off in a drop box, they can bring it right to the Board of Elections at 7.59 on election night. Now, on election night, when those results are pushed for everybody to see, about 95% of the mail ballots that have been received are part of those results. That last 5% that came in on the day or two before the election still need to go through the certification process. And that's why in the day or two after the election, the results are still being updated because the Board of Elections has to be diligent and make sure that the signatures on those envelopes are matching the signatures in the voter registration system. So that's why when you see election night, they're unofficial results. Nothing is set in stone at that point. And over the next day or so, those results are gonna change very, very uh, minor, or, uh, insignificantly, I should say, or I guess it depends on the size of the margin, but very few, very few uh, votes are added to the totals after election night. It's that last 5% or so of mail ballots. So even one drop of poison here isn't acceptable to what you're saying? No, I mean, because the Board of Elections is certifying every mail ballot that comes in by, okay, eight, by the, 8 o'clock. The point is if that there's, there's going to be a separation somehow, correct? That there's going to be a separation or isolation of signatures from the, so once, once it's certified, there's two different, okay, so Greg just said that there's two different, uh, you can be registered, it's not illegal to be registered in two different states, right. it's illegal to vote. But the domicile check, that domicile of one state versus another, the very reason why we have this kind of thing, there's a real time, real deadline yeah, that's involved. That's happening after. So if people are, uh, people are voting in two states, and you've already separated because you certified, are you going to go backwards and you know validate the, all, all of those people? It's a real time issue, right? Correct. So again, so I'm not I'm not no, saying that you're, you're not you're working right. the effort, but it's a no, lot you're, of stuff you're involved. You're right. That's a that's a so, ex post facto process. You're exactly. Right. So so what's happened there is that you can have people that have been uh, elected, but it, that that check needs to actually. What I'm saying is there, there's no there's no comparison. You're trying to take care of all of these issues, but you have to do that due diligence up front to make sure. And when you have people registered in multiple states or multiple locations, and I know there's the military and everything else, it needs to be the re the reason why we had the before the day of election. The, in fact, it was 20 days before where mail ballots had to be returned was to qualify those people and check against their records and remove them prior to the actual deadline. And what we're seeing now is everything is being expanded one way, but authentication is not. It's actually the authentication window is closing and the opportunity window to fraud is opening. And we don't want to see that. We want to see authentication up front yeah. first. So I know that right now you have legislation that's passed. My questioning that goes on there is what time does, what's, what's, the, what's the point of no return? When it does, when's the point of no return? Because you can have a, a situation where mail ballots are coming in, they get separated, you find out after the fact, but you've now just destroyed somebody's particular election. And it may be one or two votes, yeah, they can get that close, right? So we have that kind of thing, and if we're talking about removing a plurality, constitutionally, and you know, there's legislation in, in play here, right? So the constitutional being changed by certain factors, and you're removing those, those things, at what point does that, that opening of that door or the possibility become the point of no return? Yeah. It's a real-time issue, right? Yeah. And, 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 and I, you know, I, I brought it up, right? And so, right, exactly. We, 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 prosecuted, we prosecuted those people after the fact, right? But I mean, it's it's so so. There's a, a defensive, a risk analysis and measures that you take up front versus after the fact. It's too late if you've already taken the poison. Yeah, you know, we've all seen the movies. We've all like you know. Yeah, crazy and, that's, stuff. and that's why voterless maintenance is so important. Exactly. And, and so that is why I can't stress enough that every single day. The, the 39 cities and towns are doing voterless maintenance every single day. And so, it, you're right, it's really, really important that we get that information from other states to see where people are, are registered to vote. We're part of the ERIC uh, system, the Electronic Registration Information Center, where we get we get the voter file, we send our voter file and DMV files. But those are late. Those, that? those are, those are, you no, no, get them, we, we, we do that, we do that multiple times a year. 
I, I understand, but it's a long time period. What, what I'm saying is that, that responsive times are not instantaneous. We live in the age where we have a, we have a sm cell phone or smartphone, and we do something, we get, we get instant responses, and you know that. Mm -hmm. And you've been responsive with regards to my asking, in, inquiring about the central voter registration system requirements, <coughs> but the timing that's involved in there requires a real-time access to almost the entire United States and everybody that would be eligible to do the comparison in real time. And I'm not saying that's something we can handle here, but there's a cybersecurity issue involved there, right? So access of real-time information that's flying around, and you can see where it's going. You guys are dealing with things, and if the centralized voter registration system has to be accessed at multiple points, those points right there have to be not only secured, but why do we need them online to begin with? That's the question. Why do we really need them online? Is it the election night results are so important that we actually going to sacrifice the security of our elections? When you're talking about online, you're talking about the, the, the central, central voter registration. registration systems online. It receives stuff all online. So when any of the signature, I grant you, you have to have some sort of signature comparison. Signatures have to be available. That's why the vote, the jurisdiction of record would have been the actual facility inside for, for islands, the towns, other places in the counties. But you would actually do the comparison right there against what was written from a document standpoint with a wet ink signature. So you can do your comparison, you know, okay, but, but even further than that, you might know the person, like many people would know other individuals. You'd recognize their voice, everything else. So, okay, you're fine. With the mail ballots, we don't have that. And yes, it can become overwhelming data-wise. So we've talked about that. But the, the timing and what has to happen is, is, is we've, we're seeing the sort of the whiplash going on. You want to have the, the qualifications all put in place, but the same standards that you're using to qualify candidates are not being used at all with regard to the mail ballot. So and it's tough. So unless, unless there was, and I'm thinking a lot here. So so unless, unless there was a, a federal law that that uh, made it illegal to be registered in two locations, and someone were to return their ballot on election day, I don't see how how we could stop that <laughs> because we couldn't pull them from the system because federal law doesn't. There is no federal law governing that. So we 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 actually couldn't remove that. So I don't, I don't know how we could react to that late return ballot prior to when that's being returned because people are allowed to be registered in two states. Okay, going, or, or to, one the, two states. going to the Dennis versus, Dennis J. Roberts versus the Board of Elections, 1957, you know, you know, the, you know the history of that. I, I, I know, I know. Okay, the so, so there's, there had to be a clo closing, this, this dealt with the issues of mail ballots coming in after the whole thing opened up, after World War II. And what ended up happening was that they had passed the legislation and said there has to be a closing of the polls. That was the finding of the Rhode Island Supreme Court. There needs to be a closing of the polls. But in order to have the closing of the polls, they did not merge or mix any of the ballots that were coming in. <coughs> we have a mail ballot system that works entirely different than the poll voters. That's an unequal burden. True? It's different true, true benefits and burdens, correct? It operates, it's, it's operates completely yep. different. So because it operates completely different, there's two different standards going on. Because you're not, you're not testing the signatures from the, the, the poll pads, and there's poll pads being used, but you're also testing people signatures another way. Right. So these things are starting to conflict. So you the clo have a, the right. closing of the polls early with regard to the Dennis J. Roberts decision and what was stated there, and what came out of that was it gave people time to say, we don't separate the certifications from the actual mail ballots. And then even there's even a problem with having it on the envelopes. And I know I'm beating you guys and it seems like I'm going over the history of it, but the, the certification envelope and the ballot itself, it's like, you know, you can sign right on it and all that. That's, that, doesn't, that doesn't treat people the same because when we get ballots at the polls, those aren't, these aren't folded up the same way, they're not treated the same way, they're not even managed the same way. So there's two different things going on there. And that's what I'm looking at prior 
prior types of, of systems, have we legislated of our way into a conundrum? Have we legislated our way into issues? Elections are not the same as everything else. And when you have these timelines that come down to the wire, you gotta take and, and say, how do you treat everybody the same? How do you do this? And defer until you can guarantee that everybody that's on the registration list and everybody that you receive ballots from are all correct, legit. It's the, the balance of these are the people, we the people, the constituents you're working for, and then here's what they say. But this is closed. The polls are the poll, the polls are closed, the ballots are closed, nobody sees anything. You have both counts and you can compare those two, and now you have that authenticity and explicit act of the people. All right, is that true? So, so if you understand it, I do. Um, but, I, but I think what you're saying is that the is that there shouldn't be a mail ballot process other than for fill in the blank. Okay, so so the, mail the, the only way to do what you're asking to do would be to to restrict the mail ballot process. It's but it, there is, no, it's actually this, the restriction is not a matter of the mail ballot process. It's the timing of the restriction and to be able to, the capability to be able to go through and do the canvas up front for that authentication issue. It has to do with what we're what we brought up against in terms of the candidacy and putting that stuff on there. There's multiple issues, but that's the primary one that I see always coming up is that the window is sort of opening up until like last minute. And again, it's hard to take and get information from other states. It's hard to get information about what's happening. If those are the things that are causing issues with authentication and arguments and discussions that go on, sort of the, everything that we see happening, why are we trying to take and close the amount of time that we find to validate things after they've been merged? It's okay. like, okay, it's like putting the wound on because you, know, you, you want to stop the wound before. Sure, but, but you know, I, protective I think, armor is much better than, than, than you know making hospitals. Sure, that kind sure. Of but but I think the I think the the percentage of the late arriving ballots is, is very small. But if for one vote, no, no, one no, vote. But, but but I'm saying I don't think that puts a burden on the verification system. So so I mean it's it's if the election came down to one vote, one or the other, right? It actually counts as two, right? Because one that's going to go in, and you know that, right? So it could be that one vote. If somebody put that in, that could be a decision that could impact based on the policies or platforms sure. being promoted, correct? Sure, but that's no different than an in-person one vote. So the one the one vote in terms of the mail ballots, but Yeah, so so what, where, where's the I mean, if 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 there's a machine error for one vote or Correct. So we want to eliminate those things and make sure that there's much as much quality in our elections as possible. Sure. Which is why we do the audit, right? To make sure that right. the machines have the, well, the ballots correct. Okay, how many audits have been done on the on the central voter registration system? Audits on the system. And who conducts those audits? Uh, what do you mean by audits on the voter registration system? The central voter registration system has the ability to conduct an audit. You have you have logs and stuff of auditing materials. In the central voter registrations, I don't want to hog the whole time. Yeah, we do have to get to other question, questions, Chris. I mean, I, I think what, from what the secretary said at the yeah. beginning, we're operating under the process that's established in law. So if, if you believe that- But the elections debt, help establish the law, wrong. That's what I'm saying. That's right, but, but, our, but our office, our job is to operate the election within the current law. And so we're and not- The current law has been modified by prior elections, which gets right. modified by- uh, what, What's the point of no return? Yeah, I just what I'm saying, saying is that when we're talking about the mail ballot process, we've got a process that we have to follow that the Board of Elections has to follow by law. If right. there's, if you have an issue with the fact the way the law is written, you know, certainly there are ways to, to change it. But our job, especially in 2024, is to make sure that we operate the election under the under the current law. Now, I did see a hand in the, in the back. We'll come back to you for this. Oh, <laughs> I'm going to take a break. I'm going to get coffee. I probably don't need it. So, is it me or? I mean, mail ballot, first of all, there's all kinds of gray areas established with mail ballots. Did you just, uh, am I hearing you correctly that it's law now to allow mail in ballots? Because mail in ballots just became fashionable in the 2020 election because of, no, I know about military, I know about people who are not able to be at the polling location. 
but mail ballots on a broad basis became a thing in 2020. Why are we still doing this? I mean, I, not, there are other true. states, yeah, it's just, it's just, behind long, are there other yeah, states that are now limiting voting to just in-person voting? There, there, was, there, was, there were states for decades that were, were only voting by mail prior to 2020. So in Rhode Island, the mail ballot law changed in 2012. So in 2012, anybody could have requested a mail ballot. So for the last 12 years, anybody could have requested a mail ballot. And so, and so- For any the, reason. Yeah, for any reason. So that, that is the law. So you, anyone can, can check off the box that I just want to vote by mail and we will, we will send you a mail ballot so long as your information is, uh, is uh, certified by the Board of Canvassers. So this isn't a new thing. Oh, Dropbox. Yeah, Dropbox was for established in 2020, correct. Okay. That, that was, that was, yeah. I wasn't um, legislated in any way that was just, that just became a thing all of a sudden. Correct. Right? Yeah, well, well, no, so the, the Dropboxes are, are part of are part of law. Yes. That, that was the thing. A new law in 2020 that, that legislated Dropboxes? Yeah, it was 2022. Is when it was codified. In other words, they wanted to make sure they stayed after the 2020 election. I mean, we all saw... I, I, I missed that. I'm sorry. I, I, I'm sorry. I just didn't hear you. I'm sorry. No, it's, 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 I, I totally agree. I think we're in a problem. There's a lot... Well, first of all, there's a lot of radio with mail voting. There's, there's so what, what specifically are you are you concerned with the mail voting? So I know, too, I know many, many instances where, personally, people have said to me that um, they have received... So the daughter goes off to, to live in another state, and then there's a ballot sent to her in that other state, and then sent to the home where she used to live. I mean, this the duplicate ballots being sent out is is a problem. I think that mail-in voting, in my view, um, has become promoted, where you know, hey, you know, you don't need to come in and vote here. Just go drop your your, your ballot in the box. So that in and of itself, even in my town. Um, um, former um, town administrator where I live in um, was saying that he saw some unscrupulous activity around the ballot boxes. And so the draw I don't recall exactly what he was saying to me, but I mean, I was getting it from an official where he himself was like, you know what, I'm really not comfortable with this whole ballot box thing. And so you're saying that it became law in 2022 because it came a thing in 2020 and they wanted to make, they wanted to make sure that it stayed in place. That's right, so a couple things about the drop boxes. First off, every drop box, there's one in every town, there's one at our office, and there's one at the state board of elections. So there's 41 around the state. All 41 of them are have 24 hour, uh, seven day a week surveillance. And even the people who drop their ballot in the drop box, they still have their ballot processed the same exact way as if someone who mails it in or drops it off. So when the Board of Elections receives that envelope with the ballot in it, the, the Board of Elections, election officials in public, make sure that the signature on that envelope matches the signature in the voter registration system. So it's just another means for people to drop their ballot off. It still goes through the same certification process that, that you can watch. Yeah, we saw all that on TV. The dropping off of the drop boxes. So, what, what, what did you see on TV? What's that? What did you oh, see? After the 2020 election, of course, there were, you know, bundles of ballots um, <laughs> being dropped off by shady characters. Um, but that's just. So, so but let's, let's talk about that for a minute. Because if the ballot is sealed and the signature matches and the barcode matches from the request, that's a legitimate ballot. And then it is reviewed by the, the Board of Elections, and this review process is similar in, in all states. I mean, some, some have more, some have less. But if someone were to deliver, no matter who that person was, 25 ballots and, and put them in that box, those still have to go through this process. So, so you, you can't, and we can talk about the duplicate uh, situation in, in a moment, but you just can't get a ballot, right? You have to apply for that ballot, you have to then sign that ballot, you have to attest, and then that's scrutinized when it comes back in. So even if there was someone delivering 35 ballots, they couldn't have requested those 35 ballots themselves. The, the, the ballots are not accessible to them. They can't get them. 
So they, they may have collected them. You know what's going on at Bridgeport, right? In, in Connecticut, there is a, a law that restricts how many ballots can be delivered. And they re-ran an election uh, based, based on that uh, just, just recently. They re-ran an election in North Carolina uh, based on a uh, mail ballot situation. In Connecticut, it was the Democrats. In North Carolina, it was the Republicans. Uh, there, it's, a, it's an equal opportunity issue. But in both cases, people were caught and prosecuted. Uh, for those for those things, and and the North Carolina situation was well before 2020, uh, so this mail ballots are not are not new, and, and and I think Rob can give you the data since 2020, since the pandemic uh, ended, um, the the level of mail ballots in Rhode Island has precipitously shrunk. Shrunk. Most Rhode Islanders, uh, is it the vast majority? It's it's a clear majority of Rhode Islanders vote in person on election day and early in person. Uh, the, the number of mail ballot requests and the number of mail ballots that are being returned is is back down to what would be a, a, a relatively normal level uh, post pandemic. Can I ask another question? Um, so I have a problem um, with the uh, voting machines themselves. Um, I know that they roll out the machine and it says Dominion on it. Okay, great. So I'm going to stop here. Right here. Uh, we don't have Dominion machines in Rhode Island. We've What's never that? had. We've never had Dominion machines in Rhode Island. Yes. Ever. Yes, so when you opened up the machine, it looked like a Dominion machine, all right. But I don't, I, I don't, I can stand corrected on that. But when he opened it up, because he was showing us how it worked, it said ESNS software on it, and you just mentioned it yourself. I mean, if you look up ENS software, it's clear that it's a, it's. They kept telling us that the um, machines are not connected to the internet. I think he, we felt we needed to say that three or four times. And but yet, how can, I, how can we as um, voters become convinced of the fact that these machines are not online? Um, why do we even need these machines to begin with? We have the capacity to count the votes in a timely manner. Um, other states are actually voting uh, to, get, to eliminate these machines. Why are we using these machines? So, so you mean in comparison to hand count? Right. Almost, I don't know of an elections official, uh, a professional elections official who wants a hand count. It's about an 8%, it's about a, no, I don't mean politicians. There are a lot of politicians who want hand counts. I don't know of anybody that deals in elections that want hand counts. It's about an 8% failure rate in hand counts. That's just a fact. In a machine count, there's less than 1% failure rate. But the vote can be manipulated if it's online. And they can't be manipulated by hand count? But, and, and not to mention, we also run risk limiting audits after the election to make sure that the machines read the ballots the way voters intended them to. This is another public process that actually you can participate in. People sit at a table just like this with, with actual ballots that come out of the voting machine and, and people hand count them to make sure that the machines read the ballots the way voters intended them to. This is called a risk limiting audit. It happens a week or two after the election before it's certified just for that reason to make sure that we can prove that the machines have read the ballots the way voters intended them. They're not counting an entire election, they're counting a precinct to, to check the, the ballots, correct? Just to double down on that, and I understand you do the risk audits, just to clarify, how is the risk audit picked? Is it in like a tumble machine and you put all the uh, precincts in? So that is also has to be that, you know. That's correct. There's there's three or four mail ballot precincts, three or four early voting precincts, and three or four election day precincts that are chosen for the Board of Elections to conduct a risk limiting audit, and then they choose a race. So in 2020, the Board of Elections chose their presidential race. And so there were people sitting at tables just like this with a stack of ballots that came out of their machine, and two people would look at the ballot. And if, it was, if they could agree that it was a vote for Biden, it would go in the Biden column. If they could agree it was a vote for Trump, it went in the Trump column. And they made sure that whatever the outcome of that manual count matched what the machine sold us. And again, that's in public. And if you don't want to attend, you can actually watch it. They stream it live. The Board of Elections streams it live, and you can watch every minute of it. Both parties are present. The Democrat and Republican Party, the... Yeah, I mean, it's a public meeting, so the, the Board of Elections has to post it, and I know that they uh, their, their goal, and, I, and they might even have to, those pairs have to be from two different parties, whether it's a Democrat and an unaffiliated, a Democrat and a Republican, a Republican and unaffiliated, the Board of Elections makes sure that happens. Who picks that? Same with the signature verification. Who picks those from, the part, from these parties? The, the Board of Elections employs those folks. But you can, you can, you can contact them and, and take a part. Always looking for people to help. Yeah. 
So you, you mentioned the level of scrutiny applied. It seems to be different, though. For the mail ballot, it's a signature. To vote in person, there's still voter ID. Right? Correct. Um, doesn't that feel like the level of scrutiny is different? Yeah. Right? I mean, you're looking at someone, you can see the picture, you can check their ID. Mm -hmm. A signature feels like it, can, it could be it could be well, well, I guess it could be forward, but so can an ID. Um, so I guess I guess the question is, you know, these signatures that Rob described it perfectly, right? There's multiple signatures they're looking at. You know, the training of the folks who are looking at those and, and what we see across across the country, especially in those states that vote entirely by mail in like Utah, is folks are getting disenfranchised because so many signatures are being thrown out, right? There, there's actually a, a level of scrutiny that is greater with the signature because people can't agree that that's a legitimate signature. Um, whereas if you slide the, the ID in and it comes up, you know, everybody's gonna agree with it. No one's gonna push back, right? No? There's so much fraud going on behind that. Behind what? Because, because when machines validate signatures, there's a level of- There's no machine validating signature. Okay. The poll no, there's human beings that validate the signatures. When, when signatures are validated, there, there can, in other things, there's a level that of validation that's required. Sure. There's the highest level, and then there's a the low level. <coughs> many, many machines of the states have very low levels of validation. So, so I can't speak. And they're accepted. Right, we can't speak to any other state. We no, don't hear that no, we human can't. beings. Because you're looking at an audience that's well informed, we can't begin to. But, but I can't. To. I can't speak on other states. I have no. I have no knowledge. I'm not asking do. you to. But, but I'm telling you, you But I'm telling you, in Rhode Island, human beings are looking at a screen with those signatures on them. They are comparing, and then they have to agree. If one of those two people does not agree, and they go through training uh, on signature, if one of those people does not agree, then the then the uh, signature is not accepted. I think my point and is the ballot is not. But there is a difference. Feel like the, there is a difference. A signature is easier to forge and to present than a, than an ID card. You grant that? I, I guess. Yes. I, I guess. Um, but I, w I would say this: it's not just the signature on that ballot, right? That person is in the voter registration system, so they register. Right? So, so when they registered, they presented some sort of some form of identification when they registered. And then when they apply for the ballot, it has to come to that address that they applied to the ballot. So there's a connection between the address and the person there as well. So there is a backup. Look, we, we talk about this. If, if, some, if a legislator wanted to add something to that process, we would be open to looking at that. Now, I would say you shouldn't add a photocopy of a of a, an ID, I don't. I don't think that does anything, uh, and I think it disenfranchises some people because they don't have the ability to get a photocopy. But the last four digits of the social security number or the ID number, as well on that envelope, we'll, we'll listen to those uh, those legislative proposals uh, if if we think that makes the system more secure or or uh, at an even level. So if you if you apply for a mail ballot through our office at vote.ri.gov. You go in and you punch in your Rhode Island ID. If you don't have your Rhode Island ID, we won't send you a, a mail ballot application. I assume, this is an assumption, that over the course of the next decade, almost everybody that applies for mail ballot will do it through vote.ri.gov and they'll have to punch in their ID number. It's verified through us and then we send the mail ballot out based on that. And it's not just anyone that has a license or an ID. You have to be registered. It has, to vote. It's registered to vote with a Rhode Island driver's license or Rhode Island identification. What's gonna happen with the drivers the driver privilege cards now though? Are they gonna be eligible to you vote, especially with the legislation that's in right, right now? You have to be registered, so they can't register to vote. So why are these cards identical to the driver's Again, license? Again, that's a that's a legislative question. Uh, we're dealing with the process. Uh, the, legis le the legislature passed legislation that said that the cards would be identical in appearance. Uh, I explained earlier in this process that the DMV segregates the non-citizens from the citizens during that process. So they share that data with us. Uh, you know, the, le the legislature made the decision to, and I voted, I voted for that bill, um, to, to make the cards uh, identical so that no one would be stigmatized if they had to show that. Show that call. Uh, well, 
It's very disconcerting I'm, I'm, for people. Well, I'm, I'm not going to debate this. I'm telling you the reasons that, that were given to uh, on the legislation. I, I'd rather stay on the process of voting, uh, but if someone shows up with that card at a polling place, it's going to say voter not found. Uh, if they try to register to vote with that card, we're going to get a, a data point. And by the way, I don't know why anyone who is undocumented would try to register to vote and put themselves under scrutiny to be deported after what they did to get here. Uh, it doesn't make any sense to me. It makes no sense whatsoever to have someone put themselves uh, under a spotlight with like going to government and saying, here I am, uh, and I'm committing a felony. I, I don't know why anybody would do that, but if they did do that, we get that cross cross tab section, uh, and and then we would hand over that information to the attorney general or local law enforcement. They escape prosecution. Look, I, and I, again, I can't deal with that. It's not my role to prosecute. In the back. Yep. Thank you. Good morning. Good morning. Secretary Amore, I have a twofold motion to walk. On Monday, the Rhode Board of Elections on Thursday narrowly passed a proposal to let voters. Um, deposit ballots in the uh, drop box 35 days prior to the election, and now I guess it's going to the General Assembly, and I'm wondering if you can comment on that. And then my second comment is, I think, if I remember correctly, you mentioned the word misinformation. Now, URI is partnered with the Department of Homeland Security, and they've been training teachers in Rhode Island um, what misinformation is, and then to pass this on to the students in Rhode Island, and what I understand, uh, primarily you've been trained that anything conservative seems to be misinformation. And I was wondering if you have anything um, to say about that, if you support that. And I was hoping also our two senators um, would be, might want to comment on either one of these. Thank you so much. So I'm just going to um, quickly explain the Board of Elections vote that you're talking about from Thursday was, uh, right now the drop boxes are open on the 20th day before the election. And what the Board of Elections debated was to open those drop boxes, to allow the cities and towns to open those drop boxes 35 days before the election. Not to drop ballots, because voters don't have ballots 35 days before the election, but to use them to drop off voter registration forms or mail ballot applications. So the, the deadline to register to vote is 30 days before the election. So the thought process at the Board of Elections was we should allow people to drop off voter registration forms into the drop box if they want. Uh, before the before the deadline, so voters don't have their ballots until about the 26th day before the the election. So that what they voted on was to allow folks to use that drop box for things other than uh, a voted ballot. Well, let me answer the second question. I'm I'm not actually familiar with what's going on at URI. Uh, then the Homeland Security and um, I, I know there was an effort uh, earlier on last year. Maybe that was associated with URI. Um, I think it's called Courage Rhode Island or something. I, I, I can't remember. Um, but but look, in, in my view, when I said misinformation, I'm talking about facts, right? So so we've heard some facts today that were not facts, right? That we have Dominion voting machines. That's misinformation, right? That's just a fact. Now, I, I look, I I am a I am a absolute believer in the marketplace of ideas. And so I am totally against restricting anybody's ability to say what they think in any form uh, and let the marketplace of ideas determine whether that's a good idea or a bad idea and let voters demonstrate that through their vote. I, I don't want anybody's mouth closed, anybody's access to a public plat platform shut down. I want people to be able to critically think, listen, read and understand and then make their own decision. I, I don't want them watching cable news to do it. I don't want them listening to me to do it. I want them to read, research, and think themselves and then make a decision. And so anything that is pushing uh, um, the populace in one way or the other, uh, I, I think I actually have confidence in Americans. I think uh, in the end, Americans are pretty smart uh, and they'll make the right decision. Uh, and whatever that decision is, we, we as a country need to live by that decision in a, in a majority uh, country, and then, we, and then we move on. And then we fight the fight the next day to make our own point of view out there in the marketplace and have people decide. But, so, so, I, so I know misinformation takes on a lot of uh, different definitions these days, but I'm just talking about you know, facts, right? Uh, just, I, I can't, when I say that I can't talk about an election system in, in Colorado, I can't. I, I don't, I'm not, I'm not, uh, I'm not in uh, informed enough to talk about that. 
So, so I should I should say fact based uh, rather than that because I know misinformation has a lot of. Sometimes people call me a progressive. I, I don't even I don't even know I don't even know what that is, right? I, you know, Teddy Roosevelt was a progressive. I was a history teacher, so I can I can do this. Uh, but some people call me a progressive. I, I think the people that are around me uh, would never call me a progressive, right? I, I'm I'm a pretty I'm a pretty uh, moderate thinking person, and I don't dismiss anybody's point of view, and I listen. I might disagree, but I always listen. I never, I never say that someone is evil because they disagree with me. Um, I, I think that's gotten us in a lot of trouble in this country on both sides of the, of the political spectrum. Well, the marketplace of ideas is directed from Thomas Jefferson. Yes, know that yes it is. Yes. Well, you wrote the you know, colony house, I think it was about a year ago, January, the sacred colony house, where the Declaration of Independence read right over here, which read from 1776 on. Yep. And it was a day of uh, talking about what happened in J6, and we're celebrating our Bill of Rights, basically stating that these people have been put in the gulag, that that was upholding our Bill of Rights. So maybe that's why sometimes people might think you're progressive. I, I, I'm not following that. Well, I think it's still an important news. It was a day some progressives got together on January 6th, a year or two ago, and they were basically celebrating the Bill of Rights in our colony house. And stating that what happened with the January 6th is a good thing. They thought it was upholding the Bill of Rights, where other people thought the J6 is, you know, I don't want to get off on a tangent, but they thought the J6 were expressing their right to gather, their right to Well, vote. some of them were, and then some of them were committing crimes. Some of them were committing crimes, right. Right. And some of them were protesting. I, 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 I agree with that. My name is Mary, and I appreciate you being here. I have to have some questions. So, I believe I saw a video a couple days ago our lieutenant governor stating that any person that comes into the state of Rhode Island, whether they came illegal or legally, um, they're automatically a citizen of Rhode Island. Hmm. So if we're a sanctuary state and they're considered a citizen, then they could go and they could register to vote. So they have to be a United States citizen to register to vote. Uh, and you have to sign an attestation, even if you were going to go through that process, you would be signing an attesta attestation after you read that it is a felony uh, punishable by deportation. You have to be a U.S. citizen uh, to vote. Now, I didn't hear what the Lieutenant Governor said. Uh, you're, you're certainly a resident of Rhode Island, um, no matter how you came here. If you're living here, you're a resident. But you have to be a U.S. citizen to vote. So, could you please explain to me the chain of custody of the bail and when they're open and when they're so I'll start. Yeah. So the, to apply, you have to fill out an application or apply online, and it goes to the Board of Canvassers. And I want to take a moment to recognize the Borough Board of Canvassers that are here, uh, Pam Pelletier from the Board and Vicki Martin, the Town Clerk. Uh, for those of you that live in Boroughville, you've got excellent uh, election officials here. And for those that live in other towns, you do as well. Um, so thank you for, for being here. So you apply with your local Board of Canvassers. Uh, yes, they deserve a You apply with your board of canvassers, and then once the board of canvassers signs off on, on an application, the, the uh, secretary of state mails the ballot to the individual. So the individual receives their ballot, and then when they vote it, they send it back to the board of elections. So there is all three election entities in the state are involved in mail ballots. You apply with your local board, we mail it, and it is returned to the board of elections. Once it gets back to the board of elections, the board of elections has election officials that certify the mail ballots in public where they look at the envelope to make sure the signatures match. They separate the ballot from the envelope so that the anonymity of the vote can be kept. And then for those ballots that are certified, they are fed through the voting machine and tabulated. And then on election night, those results are released to everybody so that you can watch it on TV. So, but then you would know, you tabulated so many mail ballots today, you would know where those votes you do not. So they, when I say they certify and run them through the voting machine, that results button is not pushed until after the polls close. So nobody knows early voting or mail ballots. Nobody knows who's winning, who's losing at, at that particular point. And that's the board of elections. Yes. Yep. We'll go ahead. Thank you. Um, am I correct in the uh, statement that to apply for a mail ballot? Uh, mail ballot application, there is no uh, signature identification and no photo ID um, verification as well. There is signature verification to apply. 
signature to apply. Yes. yes. Okay, thank you. And now, how are you handling the well, unless, you're, unless you're applying through our office. If you're applying through the online portal, you have to put your ID number in. Okay, but no signature verification. Correct. So, that'll happen on the back I could know someone's voter ID. I could know their name, their address. It's, it's, the, it's, the, yeah, it's their state and their ID. Voter ID and I could apply for a mail ballot application. Not legally, no. Excuse me? Not, Not legally, legally, no. But still, that's a Not legally. Correct. But it's a possibility, is what I'm saying. Yeah. Sure. Right? There's no stopping second of all. So I get the mail by, ballot. By the way, that's the case with everything. Every crime. Oh, yeah. I can go rob a bank. I can go rob a bank. This is serious. It, so is every crime. This can affect our the outcome and of our election. When elections. someone drives drunk, they because can kill my family member. People people commit crimes. We do the best we can to make sure, sure that they, they're caught if they do commit the crime and that they're prosecuted. But but the idea that this is a perfect system, it is not. I've said that in every forum. This but the is legislation a, airs on error based on the previous legislation. The, which one? Which legislation? That they that you don't have to verify signature and you don't have to verify voter ID for a mail for a ballot application. So you have, you have to do signature. Correct. So I get the ballot because I know her name, address, and voter ID. Stay now you are accepting, and I know in the newest legislation, you are accepting exits for people who cannot sign their name. Well, that's not good. Yeah, it's been forever. That's so how would you how how is this illegal? So, so uh, let's play your scenario out. So you apply for for her mail ballot, and using our online portal with the with with her uh, driver's license number, you're a felon twice. And then when you but when you return the ballot, that signature on the envelope has to match the signature in the system. So when you sign your name, when you sign her name, they're gonna they're gonna throw it out because the signature doesn't match. But I might know her signature. I mean, it, How it, many of those have you thrown out? The, the Board of, the board of, the board of Elections does that. Yeah, we just send the ballot. The Board of Elections, they, they, they you adjudicate. You don't know how many? That the board, no, I, I don't know how many they, they throw mean, out. How many signatures are? How many were thrown out because of these circumstances? But just to clarify. How many circumstances where people have been indicted? So, just to clarify. So those are two different questions. But, but let me ask, ask the, the first Both one. Them. First. So, normally what happens is, if a signature is rejected, there's an outreach to that voter. And that, that voter is, is given an opportunity. In Rhode Island, it's, it's, it's pretty easy because we're so small. That voter is given an opportunity to cure that ballot, so prove who they are. And they'll come in with some, some <coughs> legitimate form of ID and make their case to the Board of Elections that this was me. I had a stroke, so my signature is different. They'll make that case, and then they'll sign a new thing for the next time. Now, that doesn't happen in every case. Some, sometimes the, the people are, they can't contact them, they're not available, and so that, that ballot is not, is not, uh, is not counted. And that was your first question. And your second question was how many people have been indicted? Um, and so I, I don't know the answer to that. I don't know. I know, that, I know that most of the voter fraud in Rhode Island that has been prosecuted has been people voting from business addresses uh, that are not their domicile. That, that's been the majority of voter, prosecutable voter fraud uh, in, in Rhode Island. These are people who are, who are voting from a business address, they registered from their business address, uh, and, and, that's, and, and that's been cleaned up uh, significantly over the course of the last few decades as well. That's the, that's the majority of, of voter fraud. And that and the, the double voting, right? Someone who's voting in uh, two states, they have two homes and they're voting in two states. But I don't know the numbers, I'm sorry, I don't have them. Hi, uh, thanks for uh, being here. Um, my question is, on, uh, you know, I hear a lot about uh, ballot harvesting and Is that allowed in Rhode Island? And so what's the election integrity? Yeah, there, there are no restrictions to someone collecting ballots and returning them in Rhode Island. Can you repeat that, sir? There are no restrictions to someone collecting ballots and returning them in Rhode Island. Uh, our, our, law is, our law is silent about that. That person doing that, is that, is that we, we, we don't. We, there's, there's, there's no, it's like, that's also the same case with a, a U.S. mailbox, right? They're not, they're not even being surveilled. The drop boxes are being surveilled. Uh, but the, the U.S. mailboxes are not, 
right? If you drop your mail, your mail down the U.S. mailbox, it, it is what it is. But but there is no current law in Rhode Island that restricts <coughs> who can handle mail ballots. Right. Just one, one other follow-up. You mentioned that earlier about predominantly uh, in-person voting is the highest percentage. Yeah, like the mail in crowd, obviously you have it. My, my guess is that two thirds of the people vote in person, whether that's early or on election day, is, is a rough guess. And I can, if you give me your contact information, I can get you that, that exact uh, percentage uh, tomorrow. And I just want to follow up on your first question that no matter how many ballots someone puts in, I want to reiterate that if someone puts in a ballot for, for them and their husband and their wife and their daughter, every single ballot is scrutinized the same exact way. So the Board of Elections has to match that signature in order for the ballot to be counted whether you put your entire family's ballots into the drop box or you just put yourself. Okay. Yes, sir. Um, who picks up the drop boxes? How, who controls your place to make sure that what they pick up is what they drop off? So the, the board of canvassers has to have, they, the board of canvassers are responsible for retrieving the ballot from the drop boxes. Okay. So there is, they do have to file an affidavit. I there's two pairs. So I've retrieved, you know, five mail ballots from the drop box on Tuesday, November 1st. Then the State Board of Elections sends out a pair of drivers to collect those, those uh, I'm sorry, those <coughs> mail ballots. Those mail ballots are, once the local board of canvassers retrieve, retrieve those mail ballots, they lock them up in, in their own drop boxes that you need, you actually need a key to open up. So from there, that's where the board of Can the State Board of Elections sends a pair of drivers to pick up those ballots. They have to affirm that they've collected those ballots from the secretary um, from the local board of canvassers and then those are driven back to the state board of elections and one other thing that hasn't been mentioned yet is that anyone who votes by mail can track their mail ballot so if you if you want to give your ballot to somebody because you're unable to to get to a drop box from the board of elections you can actually track the track the fact that that ballot was in fact dropped off so if you go onto our website and you put in your information, you can see when we mail you your ballot, we can, you can see when the ballot was received by the Board of Elections, you can see whether or not it was accepted and whether or not it was counted. So if you were to trust somebody with your ballot and they were to not drop it off, you could easily track that. And if it were to happen, and in my experience it hasn't, but if it doesn't, you, we, you contact our office and we figure out who dropped off your ballot or why was the ballot not accepted. So we do have a really, uh, Really robust way to track mail ballots on our on our uh, website. Yes, we finally came back around to you. Okay. I've been working on my computer science degree out at night online. Awesome. To try to keep up with. Okay. <laughs> to try to keep up with you. But. So, so I mean, just want to answer a question. Uh, or actually, the first thing I want to address is that is that in Rhode Island we have the, this this thing where we are a sanctuary state. Is it legal to say I'm going to ignore the law if we find out that there is felons in the state? Because breaking, as I understand, breaking and being present in the United States, I'm not talking about people that are here documented. I'm talking about people who can't distinguish between the two. And we know that. So is that is that possible to have, you know, a legal... So you, you're, you're saying would somebody, not be, would, somebody not be, would somebody not be prosecuted who voted illegally? Is that your question? Yeah, it, no, it actually has to do with the residency in the state issue. Because just simply being present doesn't make you a constituent, correct? Correct. Okay. But there's got to be qualification checks made. In other words, you have to do a background check very, very thoroughly to find out if you are a resident. True? There's, so, so being registered and domiciled in one place versus another is, is critical. And, and it takes time to clear those things. Let me ask you this question. What kind of background security checks have been conducted with regards to our vendors and the individuals that are all involved in developing our systems, all of the systems. Everything having to do with not only the physical security, the, the mail ballot drop boxes, so on and so forth, but also the computerized systems, the coding for the CBRS, the coding for the poll pads and stuff like that. What kind of background <laughs> checks are done against them? What kind of standards are conducted? And how can we, the people, verify and validate that. So the voting machines are, the Rhode Island law says that our voting machines have to be certified by the Election Assistance Commission. So every vendor that has a voter... All law, aspects, Rob? Every part of it? When you, you say voting machines, let's clarify that. Are you calling into account in all aspects of that every single machine that's involved in the election? 
for the, the system. So, okay, not just the tabulators, but also the poll pads. Yeah, so I'm going to get to that. So right. the, the voting machines, by law, we have to go with machines that are certified by a federal organization, which is the EAC. So our ESNS DS200s go through a rigorous testing process that they have to be certified in. When was the last time? When was the what? When was the last time they were certified? Uh, you can, we can, I can get that for you on Monday. It's right on the EAC website. So, okay. so the, and then the, the poll pads, when we did our RFP for the poll pads, they had to go through a security audit in at least two other states, and I can provide all of this information to you, the RFP for our poll pads and all that, uh, and then our, uh, our voter registration system, we also, through the RFP, have technical guidelines that we worked with NIST, the National Institute of Standards and Technology. That's currently headed by Gina Ramona, correct? Uh, yes, I it is. She's the Department of Commerce, right? Secretary of Commerce. Okay. So, yes, so she currently is in, in charge of NIST, correct? I don't know that. But yes, it is. She, yes, okay. it is. So, so, so the our and again, we can provide all the technical guidelines sure. for all three of those pieces of equipment if you'd like on Monday. Okay. All right. And then we know you'll be there for our presentation at the Board of Elections. Awesome. Does that Monday coming up Monday? No, 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 no. no. Okay. I'm going to get back to you one day. Okay, okay. get back to you. We're working on that. We want to make sure everybody's, everybody's okay. available to us for that. I do, I do have some questions that I do want to clear. Here, graphics-wise, I'm going to discuss with you. So I can make it great. One more time. Let's, let's discuss that. Okay. You had mentioned that um, if a mail ballot was requested and uh, they wanted to know the process or the, the receipt of it, that um, they could find out whether or not it was counted. Um, is that a passive process where they have to, or, or that they have to assert that they want, or is it possible for them to be notified that you did request? Here's a confirmation it was received. Is that like the latter? So you, when you got go onto our website, you have the ability to sign up either for text messages, phone calls, or emails. So you can, or you can sign up for none and just go in and look at where your where your ballot is in the process. I have a question. Uh, so the sorry, it's warm when we get the heat hitting, so I'm trying to stay warm. The instance with Sabina Matt, uh, Lieutenant Governor Sabina Matt, who so moved in with Ramaswamy, where I think they used the same group uh, or same company to collect signatures, but the signatures were um, fabricated. Have those individuals been charged? So, to our knowledge, no one has been charged yet. The, uh, the Sabina Matos situation. Not Sabina, not Vivid, but the person who certified, you know, went to the clerk, and the clerk stamped and said, yes, I see that you, you certified that I collected. Okay, when I collect signatures, you mean I the, the notary. The notary, right. I go to the clerk and I say. But said, the, no, the notary is not verifying that the signatures are correct. The notary is right. verifying that the person who collected Witness. the signatures exactly. is who they are, Witness. is who they say they are. So the person who said they collected these signatures, but they did not actually that, collect that, the signatures, that, that are those being first prosecuted? To our, to our knowledge, yeah. That, I mean, okay. they, those, those names have been handed over to the uh, law enforcement officials in the cities and towns, and the Board of Elections just discussed uh, whether or not they had been handed to the state police as well. So we know in the Sabina Matos case, that case is, is under investigation, and the Attorney General has said that we should expect something on that like now, right? right? I mean, you've heard him say it like I've heard him say it. I'm, I'm waiting to hear that too, because look, in, in my view, those folks have to be prosecuted to the full extent of the law, right? Uh, th there has to be a deterrent uh, to that type of behavior. That's, that's, that's fraud, it's clear fraud. And by the way, on that process, um, every state, collects signatures for candidate placement on ballots. We, we're not an outlier there. That, that happens everywhere. And sometimes people say, well, don't you think they should have to present an ID when they do that? I mean, you don't want to show your ID to somebody knocking on a door uh, asking for signatures. You, you don't want to do that. So you, you, you trust that you know the campaigns are using voter registration lists to go to the right people and get those. And when somebody commits a crime, they should be prosecuted. So the the uh, the DMV 
who, who registers to vote at the DMV and who registers online, we get that data. So the cities and towns will process those records every single day. The reason why we get this correction files every 30 days is because a, a vast majority of folks that serve time in prison serve less than 30 days. So a lot of times we're getting the name of somebody who's been incarcerated and that same name is on the release list as well because perhaps they only served 10 or 15 uh, days in jail. So the law is what requires the daily files from the DMV. It requires a monthly file for the corrections. It also requires a monthly file from the Department of Health Vital Statistics. But to your point, we wanted that more frequently. So now we get it every week or every two weeks. Every two, so now we get it more, more frequently. Uh, and usually the, the uh, health file is about a month and a half behind. So if someone passes away, let's say today, we will probably get that name in uh, by the end of March. By the time it's processed, through the health department and then sent to us and we send it to the, to the cities and towns. So it, it varies on what the, what the data is and how often we get it. How about the social security? Every 60 days we get that. So that's part of our uh, membership with the Electronic Registration Information Center. So every 60 days we get a list of people throughout the United States who have passed away but are on our on our order. So that's every 60 days. So that means you got to well, we, so we do we do it quicker uh, once we get to election time. So we're going to do we're going to get a, an updated file you know, every 60 days, and then right before the election, right before the the, uh, the the books close on elections for who can register to vote, we get it then as well, right before that, so that we make sure we've got the cleanest, most up to date death file from Social Security before the election, and that'll be in early October. So that's more more reliable than the I think they're equally as reliable. I think, I think what, what the, the Social Security gives us is if someone moves to another state or is, is with a loved one in another state, passes away there, we wouldn't get that through our, our health department because they didn't pass away in Rhode Island. So that's where we get a better bang for our buck with, our, with the folks that pass away in other states. Yes, ma'am. Uh, do I understand correctly that our towns would be responsible to your oversight, you, and to law? that they be inspected and be prepared for each election um, that they're well, oversight, oversight falls with the Board of Elections for the local cities and towns. We work with the local cities and towns on training, on information system, on sharing information, but oversight is with the Board of Elections. Okay, so you work with people. Um, did you know that there were machines that were not operating correctly? Um, I worked as a poll worker. Two out of our three machines were not charged, they were not prepared, and they went down in my machine, but no plug worked in it. We had it off-site, we didn't have any parts, we didn't have anyone on-site to help repair that machine, so only two out of the three machines were working, and we waited hours for someone to come in and finally find a way to charge the third machine. So you're overseeing, but are well, you we're getting not. the reports we're that they're seeing? That's the well, board of the others are responsible, are you getting reports that this we system do. is not working? So what, what polling place was it in what election? Um, it was in the presidential election on the way, yeah, it was two years ago. So, so not the presidential election? No, it was not. Okay. Um, it was two years ago. And what polling place? And Gloucester. Which polling place in Gloucester? Because what I'll do is I'll, go, I'll talk to the Board of Elections Monday and pull the report from them, and, and I'll, I'll, I'll contact you about it. Of course. Well, what polling place was it, though? It was at the high school. Pontiacanza High School? Yes, and it was, it's the largest. Uh, Got it. So Pontiacanza High School in 2022 for the November election or the September primary? Uh, on the November election. Okay. And will you give me your email address after, we, after we're done? Yeah. Excellent. Yeah, so we, we want them to be more responsive than that. Right? And, 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 and so while, while we don't have statutory oversight, we do have influence, and, we, and we, that's what, this, what Rob just explained is what we do. You know, we say we have to do better than this because we're in the public face. Right? The, board of, nobody, the Board of Elections doesn't do this. We do this. Right? We're the public face of elections, and that's why we try to, try to take this concern, and we will bring that concern to them. Many of us here don't want to continue to go into cyberspace and into electronics as a solution for these problems because we don't see solutions in the future if we continue in this way of voting. Voting was very legitimate in the past. Hand counting is successful. It's being experimented on in the states 
It's already been done recently with 100% accuracy. So maybe some are 8%. I wish I could tell you which one it the, was. The, the, only, the only states that I know that did a hand count uh, was, was in Georgia in 2020, and they did it twice after the presidential election to prove that their machines read the ballots the way they, they did. I this was not a presidential election, but it was very recently in the past six months, and there were two elections, two different states. But and not state, state statewide elections? Uh, yes, and they were very <coughs> successful. I can get that information to you. Perfect. You Thank you. Yes, sir. Two questions follow. Every city and town in Rhode Island, um, for voting in person, is verifying signatures. Is that true? You show a photo ID when you vote in person. Okay. In some cities and towns have voter ID and some No, all 39. So everyone is voter ID. You have to show ID and you, okay. Yes. Um, my second question is the timing of um, closing the election results. Yeah, so the, the Board of Elections oversees this, but I can give you a, a high-level breakdown. So the, the uh, election day results start being reported to the Board of Elections as soon as the polls close. Those are for the precincts on election day. At the same time, the Board of Canvassers can also send the results in from their early voting machines. So every city and town at their town hall, with the exception of Providence and a few others because it's too small, uh, you, you vote early at your town hall. So those results also at 8.01 on election night are sent to the Board of Elections. Usually at about 11 o'clock at night, 10 o'clock at night, the Board of Elections will push the mail ballot results for all of the mail ballots that they have certified at that point. And as I mentioned before, they don't, it's not all of them because anyone who, who, who uh, submitted their mail ballot on election day or maybe the day before, there wasn't enough time to certify those so they, they'll get certified in the day or two after the election. So by usually 11 o'clock on election night, you're going to have, I would argue, over 90% of the results posted for whatever city or town you live in. And then the rest of it will be posted in the next day or two as the provisionals are counted, the mail ballots that came in right before the deadline are counted, uh, the, the, the folks who have their mail ballots denied, they receive a letter from the Board of Elections and they have a certain amount of time to cure that ballot. So the, ever so slightly in the days after the election, those results will change. Is there any, any deadline established at all for the protest? Uh, there is, well, so, yeah, yeah, so there are deadlines for all of it. So the military has until seven days after the election to get their ballots in. The provisionals have to be counted. The Board of Canvassers can tell me, Pam, when, 48 hours? 48 hours after the election is when the provisionals have to be brought over. All of them have deadlines that, that, that the law provides that the cities and towns to follow. Uh, usually it's longer than that because don't remember, don't forget, once all of the, the votes are tabulated, they, we then, the board then has to go through the risk limiting audit to make sure that the election was, or the machines read the ballots properly before they certify. So to your point about a deadline, in the presidential years, because we've got the electoral college to, to, to run in December, the board of elections usually certifies the election by the end of November. After all of the votes have been tabulated, after the risk limiting audits, after all of that, and the board will finally certify through, the, through a vote of the state board, usually on or around Thanksgiving is when that happens. Usually. So results are unofficial until that happens. That's right. That's right. Because nobody, nobody can get sworn in. The cities and towns can't swear in their new council people until the board actually certifies the election. That's why you see a lot of the town council folks and school committee folks not being sworn in until December because the board has to certify the, the results. And the Rhode Island Secretary of State does not certify elections like is the case in many states. And I think we do it right. Right? You don't want a partisan person certifying elections. Regarding the, uh, the process, obviously maintaining uh, integrity and accountability and obviously that's why we're going to discuss a lot of that. What I'm curious about is, you know, having spent over a decade out of the country um, and had to request, um, you know, ballots from overseas locations and things of that nature, what I'm curious about, because of what recently has occurred with, I want to call it the, you know, the, the flavor of the mail and bad ballot or whatever you want to call it, <clears throat> what I'm curious about is, Regarding the process um, for the accountability of, say, I won't even be as a you know a military person that spent time away, but someone who is had the intention of committing fraud, 
So if, if I were to ask for a ballot, you know, a mail-in ballot, I do as such, and then I show up at the polls, what is the process, um, or maybe I think you can ask the turnaround time, if you will, that that would be discovered in, I won't say person held accountable, because obviously that's due process, et cetera, et cetera, but I'm looking at what the turnaround time would be where that can say, you know, like, hey, this is a red flag right here, this person has voted twice. And I, of course, I appreciate your time for being here. So any person that applies for a mail ballot, they're automatically, they're automatically um, on the poll pad, it would show up that you have already applied for a mail ballot. So you wouldn't be able to cast the ballot and actually insert that ballot into the machine. You would have the opportunity to vote provisional. So then that provisional ballot is then sent to the state, uh, the Board of Canvassers, where they will see that you have already applied for a mail ballot. I have suspected that Sunday, there's a student here that I form. And actually, my daughter who was here earlier will become a first time voter this year. And you know, we've had our discussions, and through the years, I brought my kids to the polls to yeah. experience what it is to vote. Obviously, they wouldn't vote because they weren't of age, but um, she's really excited about it, and she has had these concerns through the media expressing, you know, fraudulent voting and things like that. So, once again, I do appreciate your information and time. We appreciate your service. Uh, first of all, I, I, again, thank you for your, you know, the, the civil t discourse that we've had today and uh, being so open. Uh, with the introduction of electronic voting, uh, I feel like, at least with a paper ballot, you know, those, I'm sure those are kept. You can, like in Georgia, they were counted twice to verify the election. Um, but what about with electronic voting? There, there, there's no paper trail. Right. Um, what confidence does a person have that their vote wasn't changed by a hacker yeah. or some system? So, so right now, the, the Board of Elections has allowed for the, for the military uh, and for those that are disabled to be able to email their ballot to someone. However, or email it back to the Board of Elections. So the Board of Elections will accept the ballot via email, but they still have to print print a ballot and, re and, and, and bipartisan folks at a table like this will remake the ballot so that the individual's vote can go through the actual machine. Because when it's sent through the email for the military who doesn't have a printer or a fax machine, believe it or not, the state law still has a facsimile in there. We don't do fax, I mean, I know. Uh, so the email is the, is the next best thing. So the Board of Elections with a bipartisan team will remake that ballot to ensure that it gets fed into the machine properly. So if you were on an aircraft carrier, right, it's hard to get that mail. Right, so and we had a case in the CD1 uh, uh, race where uh, a Marine said, look, I never got my ballot. And so he, he sent the email, and then it was printed and then run through. We sent him a, a ballot, but he never got it because it was, it was not accessible to the mail. But there's no way for him to see his vote cast or to see how it No, I mean, this, these, are, these are rare right, situations. I think that was the only one of that race, right? I can't do this right now. And it's the same with the mail ballot. You know, when you send your mail ballot in, you know, you can check online to make sure that it was counted. But you physically don't. I mean, there's an inherent trust in the process when you send your mail ballot. But I think you were, was your question about broadly, like in the United States, electronic voting? No, well, yeah, because yeah, I know it's news. Yeah, yeah, it's, yeah right. And it's just not, and, and, and we actually we actually had a discussion about this re recently with uh, House and Senate leadership over the majority of our rules. If there are no more questions, I'm freezing. <laughs> 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 But they're not on the voter rolls that are on the electronic poll book when you go vote on election day. So, so should a 16 or 17 year old uh, go on election day to vote, their name is not on the voter list. Only eligible voters are put on the voter list. And actually, it's a great point. I know we're in Burrowville, your former state representative back in, I think, 2008 or 9, Ed Pacheco put that bill in. And the reason why he did so is that he wanted younger people to get involved in the process earlier. 
you can now work the polls if you're 16 or 17 because technically you're registered to vote. So that was the intent of Representative Pacheco at the time was to get younger people involved in the process earlier. But their names are not on the, the voter list when, when they, if they were attempt, if they attempt to go vote on election day. They are not. Well, they're in the voter registration system, but they're not on the voter list at the polling place to be able to vote. So you're telling me that technically they're registered to vote? They're pre-registered. Yeah, pre-registered. Pre pre-registered. I still think that's funny. If a 16-year-old went to the polls, with their, if they had a, a license or an ID and they went to the polls, it would say no voter file. Correct. I've been able to get all sorts of motions, and that hasn't happened. Yeah. And well, we, we really can't get young people to vote, so that's, that's a <laughs> yeah. interesting but, but, but to, your, to the point earlier that we made is that we're living within the confines of the law, so we've created a process by which they will not be eligible to vote on, on election day. So despite the fact that that law passed and we had to work in our system to make sure that those folks were not added to the list that's at the polling place on election day. So you have two lists, one for the town, that shows them on there, and the other one no, but so the voter registration system is the same in all 39 towns, but we've got the eligible voters that are sent to the polling place. So that list does not have those folks on it, nor does it have folks who are canceled or anyone who's not eligible. They're not on the list that we send to the polling place. Incarcerated, and, incarcerated right? And by the way, there's a process by which voters can go into town hall and the board of canvassers will post the voter file for people to go and review before they close the books on it. So you can go and you can search, I don't know, Pam if, and Vicki, if anyone ever comes to, to view it, but you certainly, voters can, before we close the books on the election, you can go to Burrowville or Gloucester, Foster Town Hall, wherever you live, and you can look at the voter file just to make sure that those that you know aren't on there that shouldn't be on there, and you can challenge voters as a whole process before the election to make sure that our lists are as accurate as possible. You, you can also ask the Board of Elections to run you through a, a dry run of their process with mail ballots. They'll, they'll do that for you. You make an appointment, you tell them what you, what you want, and they'll run you through the entire process. It's not, it's not the real process. You can witness that as well. But if you want to see what that looks like beforehand, they're, they're uh, willing to do that. So primary ballots are different. What's the difference? So there's a Republican primary and Democratic primary, so those ballots are different. It's only Republican. Then the ballot shouldn't be different. No. Every, on, on, in a general election, ballots, everybody gets the same. You have differences in like like bond questions, right? You might have a bond question in Barber that's not on the ballot in its right, province. I understand that, but, what I'm saying, but the only time the ballots are different is during the primary. And that's where they would say at the polling location. No, don't give that one, give this one, because she's she's a registered Republican or Democrat. Unaffiliated, you can vote any way you want. We are promoting a bill now that passed the House last year. We hope that it passes the Senate this year, senators, uh, that allows a disaffiliated voter to go in. So if you're unaffiliated, you can pick your primary, which you can do now. But once you pick your primary, you've got to go disaffiliate with a form. The bill that we're putting forward that passed the House last year says if you walk in unaffiliated, you remain unaffiliated, no matter which side you vote for. And, and I think that will encourage people, more people to vote, because some people don't want to be associated with the Democratic Party or the Republican Party. They, they would rather just be unaffiliated all the time, not even for that five minutes that they want to be a Democrat or Republican, even though they're voting in that primary. And we think that's a good way to encourage more primary voters to keep them unaffiliated uh, when they walk out of the, the room. So. We hope that the Senate passes that because that allows unaffiliated voters to stay unaffiliated consistently. Is there a system in place where the state kind of audits the voter rolls to make sure that the information you're sending to the cities and towns that the deceased are being taken off? Yeah, but by the law, um, there's, there's, in fact, one of the, one of the parts of the most recent voter uh, voting laws, the Rhode Island Vote Act. Had a, has that mandated into law, is that four times a yep. year? And then, as you heard today, it's happening weekly, daily, uh, monthly in other cases, 60 days in other cases, but four times a year, definitively by law, no matter who uh, is the Secretary of State, it has to happen by law. And on, and on top of that, Kathy and Nick and the elections team can log into the system in every single city and town, and they can see 
who's doing their work. So we, when we send a list of, let's say, eight deceased voters to the town of Burrowville, that's done by noontime, the day that we send it, because Burrowville is on the ball. But we can actually see if a town's you know, not doing their work, and we call up and say, hey, how come you have a front? Oh, I, I was on vacation, I'm gonna do it. And so we can monitor that work for all 39 cities and towns. That's, that's, oh, go ahead. Well, um, I know there have been news reports that have highlighted how the voter roll seems to be so inflated, and to your credit, I think you cleared off 60,000 or so in the last year. Um, but there's still, I don't know, 100, 150,000? Yeah, so that, that includes inactive voters. So we can't take them off. By federal mandate, we can't take them off unless they've not voted for two consecutive federal elections. So that's always bulleted by the inactive voters, most of whom are not voting, but we can't, by federal law, take them off. So that, that's part of the bloating. But part of the bloating is, you know, we're, we're working at it. We're working, it's getting better and better every year. We, once we have more resources, I, mean, I, I would love to see a, a full national, nonpartisan <coughs> system where elections information is shared between states so that we can actually have cleaned up roles so that we know who's in one state uh, registered and who's in another state registered, right? We, we'd have that information, but that's not available to us now. Uh, except in the ERIC system, which is how many states are in ERIC? 20, 23. Well, that's an interesting And then we work, we also work with Florida. Since 35% of our uh, of our residents move to Florida, uh, well, that's, the, that's the, the biggest percentage of movement. So we are, our data people at the Department of State are working with the Florida people so that we can keep an eye on that uh, so that we can update voter registration. So if the, if the role is inflated by 100,000 or so, uh, but getting me greater confidence is you're saying these are people that have not been voting. Not all of them, but but a fair number are are inactive, uh, and we just can't take them off yet. Yes. You mentioned Eric, and I don't want to get into you know down a rabbit hole, um, but the, my only question is, have you guys considered or looked into any other options? Because there have been at least nine states that have disaffiliated with yeah, Eric. Yeah. I, the number might be more now. Someone mentioned 13 earlier. I have only seen nine myself. Yeah, it's but, unfortunate. Um, you know, there's a lot yeah, of there's a lot of inconsistencies and fraud. Because they've Eric. tried. That's the all the I can states say. that have left have question. tried to replicate yeah. it, and they, they, they can't do it. They, they're just not able to do that. And, and, and if, you, if you talk to elections officials, and these are mostly Republicans, uh, who, who are no longer in those seats, They'll tell you we should never have left. Yes, there were issues. The person on the board is gone now who was, uh, I guess, a, they considered a partisan. But those folks that told me in person, we should not have left because we had the best voter rolls we ever had under Eric. And, then, and they'll, they'll say that. And I know, I know, I know all the, the stories about Eric, and I just got into this role, obviously, I'm, I'm a year plus. But, uh, but I have met all those folks who uh, uh, you know, uh, were in office as secretaries of state who say, you know, if we had to do over again, we'd do it differently um, because it's such, it's such a valuable asset for us. And when Florida left, that, that hurt us, right? That's why we reached out to Florida and said, can we partner here so that we have a, a, better, a better grasp on this? And we do the same thing with Massachusetts. So Massachusetts is in ERIC. However, they have not they have not given their data yet. They're still working on it. So we have a senior data analyst in our office and we take the Massachusetts file and we, we she tries to match it up against our file. So yes, we do consider other options to update our voter rolls with states that are not part of our Interesting question you brought up about the uh, disaffiliated, having to disaffiliate when they leave. Now, being involved long time with the Republican Party in the state of Rhode Island. Uh, years ago, we used to have a closed primary. 15, 20 some odd, over, over 30, 40 years ago, we had a closed primary. They changed, the Republican Party changed it to have a, what was, what we consider, we, we still have what's considered a closed primary by definition, but as an unaffiliated voter, you can, that's why you're affiliating and disaffiliating when you leave. I know there's a discussion within the Republican Party, been going on for a few years, of, you know, it's challenging for us, there's very few Republicans elected to office uh, on, the, on the state legislature. And I know this is, but it, it runs contrary to the push that you're asking the Senate to pass. And, and I battle with this because we need to get more Republicans up there. Any, any, any party that has super majority, they don't listen to the they, they, we don't have to hear from you. We don't have to take 
your decisions, we don't have to take your advice, we don't have to work with you and compromise. And that's what I see we have in the state of Rhode Island, being a Republican. Uh, and there's discussions on the statewide party to, 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 to bolster the Republicans' voice is to actually close the primary, and then, of course, the Democrat party will fight it. My belief is they'll lose, and the first thing they will do is close their primary. So that makes that question unique. More or less allows the people, as I see in Rhode Island, when we have a primary, when the Democrats really kind of get along, the unaffiliated Democrats will come in to a Republican primary and try to move the ball to somebody they know they, they can beat in the general election. So that discussion is going on on a state level within the GOP, uh, just to let you know. So that's where it kind of, I understand the point on uh, not having a disability, but at the end of the day, it may run opposite of what the Rhode Island GOP is yeah, yeah, looking and forward the, to do. I'm, I'm agnostic on that. Yeah, yeah. That's, so that, that's, that's, that's a high level discussion. Yeah, yeah. I, um, I think what, what we have focused on is, and, and you'll see I'm, I'm on a news conference with Gene Belsanti this week, I, I talked to him about the two lanes here, right? <laughs> there's the security lane, and then there's the accessibility lane. We want more people to be involved in practice, period. Republicans, Democrats, moderates, uh, liberals, uh, libertarians, we want more people to be involved. In the lane I'm in, I want more Republicans to yeah. really stay as Republicans and, and build that party. But, to try but, it, but this, this bill only deals with unaffiliated, right? So your Republican voter is your Republican voter. But it does affect on a voting level of primary where a party can be by people that really don't so care. Yeah, yeah, when you're talking about a closed primary, yes. Correct. Yeah. The system as it exists now, I think our proposal expands voter it's, access. Exactly. Yeah. But and I agree. And, and to your earlier point, I'd like to think that this department uh, does sit down no, and work with Republicans, <laughs> and, and your leader was in our office the other day. We we're working through issues, and I will always bring the Republican leadership in on all issues and have conversations. And I want to say that um, uh, the leader, De La Cruz, is part of our uh, civic education program that uh, we're running in April, where it's right down the middle, nonpartisan, where we have students from all, uh, all, all across the state, from all political points of view, who are coming to learn how to access uh, government. They're going to do a mock session. Uh, and we have uh, many Republicans that are involved in that. We think that's a, a positive thing. Yes, ma'am. <clears throat> Should they, either the parties choose to close their primary, that's a decision that could be up to them. I would just argue at that point that taxpayers have no responsibility whatsoever to pay for the private elections of private organizations. And to the tune of significant money, they should be on their own to do as they choose. I would actually argue, as a libertarian, that government has no responsibility to private elections or primary positions. They can have a convention, they can do whatever they want, knock themselves out, but the state taxpayers have to stop subsidizing private organizations like the Democratic Party or the Republican Party. Enough of that. You guys have better things to do. I, want to, I do want to point out that the Department of State is here in uh, these two folks next to me, um, plus uh, uh, Nick Edwards who works in the department and um, Eileen Sweeney, who is our community outreach director. Nobody's getting overtime, and nobody's being paid at all these Saturday functions. They're coming because they're committed uh, state employees who are working hard on behalf of the people of Rhode Island. So uh, this is not an overtime gig or anything else. They're here because uh, they think this is important, and uh, we do too. And, and by the way, I just found out that I wasn't getting paid for this. So, I, uh, I'm kidding, I'm kidding. But, but if there's anyone, I know that if there, you know there are more questions, we will uh, get back to you. I'll take anyone's card. I'll give you my card, Kathy's card, and, and we can do things over the phone, over email. I want to make sure I know that some of you may have more questions or want to go in depth on other things. We're happy to do it at any time. So I've got cards, and we will pass them out afterwards. And, and happy to you know answer any questions in the next few weeks when you have. Them. There's one more question here. Well, I don't want to hold from you. No, no, go ahead. Go ahead. Well, I appreciate your time. Thank you for coming. Um, you touched upon the audit after the election. I was wondering if you could elaborate a little more as to um, the sampling, how you pick what cities or towns you're going to audit, um, and what's, what happens if a discrepancy is found? So the, the, uh, the, the first answer is I'm going to take your information and have the Board of Elections explain how they select those. I can tell you, uh, over um, 
overview, they take a handful of mail ballot precincts, a handful of early voting towns, and a handful of election day precincts. Uh, how they select them, I'll have them explain because I don't want to. I don't want to steer you wrong. Uh, and your second question was. Oh, so the, the so what a risk leveling audit is is they you count ballots uh, to reach a certain statistical level to ensure that the machine read the ballots the way they, they intended. So if there's a discrepancy, you just continually count more ballots until you hand counted the entire precinct. Now in the you know four or five risk limiting audits that the state has performed, there has never been a discrepancy. But the intent of the way these are, are built is that you just continue to hand count more and more ballots until you hand counted the entire state. So that was the it's, last question. That was the last question. No, <laughs> it, it's related to that though, because you have a risk limiting audit that looks at the ballots, and so you're trying to validate and verify what's on the ballot. Talk about intent, right? well, the, yeah, the validating what, right. what the machine Validates count is. What, what the machine count is, right? But the question that I have is for the audit to be considered complete, or at least, uh, we'll say, complete for the risk limit factors, you'd have to, to look at both, both sides of the equation who's registered and who's there in terms of balance. You gotta look at those, both those counts, correct? Well, that, that's not what the risk limiting audit is. I, but I, know, I understand that, but to be considered a real audit, come on. If, if you're just looking at one side, so like, you know. No, but that is done. So the boards okay. of canvassers will rectify the, the number of ballots versus the number of voters okay. and all of that. Okay, but then the question that I have on the other side is not just really that, but what kind of audit is conducted with regard to the CPRS? Because there's actually audit, I've, you know, you've, you've asked, I, I've, I've asked for the information, I've got it. You have a voter registration system that does have an audit trail and audit materials, and how is that actually conducted? How many times has the CDRS been audited in conjunction with those risk limited audits? We have two completely different things, but the CDRS it's is an audit. audit. It's an audit trail. Yeah, it's, it's, it's an audit, but it's not the same as the risk limit. So what, yeah, what so, happens so you're titling the, something one thing and another, but it's still got right, so here's how it happens. Those account, Correct. Right? So at the so when all of the data is loaded into the voter registration system for who voted, that information is checked by the towns to make sure that the, the number of ballots that were voted, the number of people that voted, all of that stuff. And by the way, that's all publicly available. So after the election. But it's all in CDRS. But it's public information, so it's part of the voter file that we give you. But is give it anyway. fixed? I'm sorry? Is it fixed? Because we talked about manipulation and, and, and how things can change. How fixed is that? How fixed in... You mean so, somebody may have died post... Exactly. These, 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 kinds, these kinds of situations yes. of somebody removed and all yeah. that yeah. stuff. So, so res resolution, what I'm asking so is... So is there, you're asking, is there a, 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 a voter file there's, in okay, in so, real time, so in it has the, not been changed post-election. No, so. in the post-election risk limiting audit process, is there a way that you also have the CVRS audited completely, no. combining those two factors? No, because the risk limiting audits, the sole so goal the, is the to the sole is to take and validate whatever went through the tablet. Correct. That's what but a risk limiting. That's not is. the full thing because the full thing is that voter registration is critical in, in determining what that number is. If you only have one half of the equation, you Not the registration, would be who actually voted. And, right. that, and that audit happens right. Right. Exactly, who actually voted. And vote. that, happens, that audit happens before the election when, they, when the boards of canvassers canvass their list and make it publicly available before they close it. And again, I, that, that particular thing goes back to the time factor. Yeah, 20 days, I think it's 20 days before the election. It's, 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 the, it's the problem, does it match up and, and all that other stuff. So I'm, we'll take that up another time. Thank you very much. Enjoy your, oh, sorry, we have one more. Last one. I have a comment. I'd like to thank you for coming to Barbo. I'd like to, I'd like to thank you for your patience, for your succinct and accurate information, <laughs> and not a lot of I have had no fun in Barbo my entire life because I was a hockey coach and a hockey player. <laughs> And Barbell High School beat the crap out of East Providence nonstop. And so this was actually a good day for me and Barbell. And, and we'd also like to thank the school committee chair for being here today as well. So thank you.